Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, so I will begin with a conversation with Tori, and then we're going to pass it over to you for your questions. So please, as you're thinking through today, as you're listening, write down your questions, put them in the chat. Um, later on this call, you'll have a chance to share them and ask Tori yourself. Um, so to begin, Tori, welcome. Welcome to our virtual space at Parsons School of Fashion. We're so excited that you're here with us. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy to be here and so happy to be partnering with such an extraordinary group of people. I feel like we have so many exciting things ahead. Oh, we do. I'm so excited. I'm so excited <laughs> for this course that we're going to launch next year. And so much of this course was really inspired by your work. And thinking of the collection we just saw as we were joining the Zoom call, uh, your spring summer 2022 collection that was inspired by a Parsons grad, Claire McArdle, and really her incredible innovation, how she emphasized freedom and access and equity for women in her designs. Tori, how did you come across Claire McArdle? When were you first introduced to her and her work? You know, it's funny, I was thinking about that question. At, at first I thought it was, I was an art history major at University of Pennsylvania and I thought it was during um, a course of trail, trailblazing American women. But I now had a talk with my mother last night and she's like, what are you talking about? I'm the one who told you about Claire McArdle. You were such a tomboy growing up. You never would put on a dress. And then I thought you should look at her clothing because she took men's wear and men's ideas and incorporated into women. So it was definitely my mom. And I, I remember vividly having that conversation uh, about Claire McArdle and just the idea of how well, so many things about Claire McArdle, but she, 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 she told women to dress for themselves. And I thought that was such an interesting revolutionary idea for back in the late forties and fifties. And, and clearly she invented, well, I'm not, I'm not sure all the students know, but one of the things I'm really interested in is making sure everyone knows that she was the inventor of American sportswear. And I would say every designer I know in Europe and in uh, the US and Asia has and is inspired by Claire McArdle. And I think the things that she uh, really was revolutionary in making happen were things that we take for granted today. Yeah, and I think what your collection really did and you really I think highlighted her and her work for a whole generation um, of people and design students that maybe weren't familiar with Claire. Really, what about her own, her story and her designs personally inspired you? Well, I mean, I think that uh, she she believed in self-expression. She she believed in freedom for women. And, and I, I, I am obviously a person who supports women's empowerment. And that's something that drives me ever since I was little. I've always been interested and why it was not possible for women to do the same things that men could do. So for her to create clothing that allowed women to have the freedom to do whatever they wanted um, was really interesting to me. She took men's um, inspirations and details and she put a zipper on clothing that she was one of the first. She put pockets in a dress. She used hook and eyes um, as details. And she really um, wasn't looking at what what everyone else was doing. I was really inspired by that. She was looking it within and really creating a, a problem solving solution for women of how women could feel like they were dressing like themselves and free to do what they wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Just like really trailblazing work that created a whole <laughs> legacy for designers to like follow afterwards and to move from. And in your own process of research for this collection, what was your process for researching Claire McArdle and for learning about her work? Well, I, I started with a book that was published in, in 1956 and it's called um, What Shall I Wear? And that was, I highly recommend it. We're reissuing it, it, um, it will come out in, in August. And it was her philosophy and design philosophy on, on how to get dressed. And, and I was just talking to Ben earlier saying that it's so brilliant and so interesting. And the way she put fabrics together with the way she emphasized a waist, the way that she paired colors, but also some of what was talked about in the book showed how far women have come to from 1950s and 40s to today, because um, it was clearly very dated, some of the things. But that said, it's also incredibly interesting how 
75 years ago is just as modern today. And those were many of her design philosophies from the very beginning. Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm sure that book was like foundational and learning about her philosophy. Did you do archival research looking at past? Oh, yeah, sorry, I didn't uh, answer that question. We went in Maryland, a center for history and culture. And that's where her family left all of her archives. And what was so amazing is we had access to all of her personal letters, all of the um, transcripts from different um, articles that were written on her. They only had 30 pieces of clothing because one thing that's really interesting about Claire McArdle is women wore the clothing to shreds. They wore them constantly. So it's it's very rare to find beautifully preserved clothing. So they have 30 and they have everything else you could ever imagine about Claire, about her philosophy, about she, some of her personal sketches. Um, it was really fascinating. They said they couldn't believe that we just delved in and we probably spent 10 hours just reading through everything. Yeah, I'm sure it was a fascinating like, <laughs> to dive into her philosophy in terms of her life. I know in our own Parsons, uh, fashion archive, we have some pieces from Claire McArdle. And I'm wondering about your process of doing all of this research and then translating it into your collections, into clothing, into products, into prints. Could you move us through what that process was like of translating yeah. the research you did? No, I mean, you know, it was interesting because I wanted to honor Claire McArdle, but I didn't want to copy Claire McArdle. And I wanted to think about where she would be today. And, and so that was kind of a really interesting journey for my design team and me. And we thought like, let's think about high level ideas about, as I mentioned earlier, her philosophy around a woman's body, about how to enhance it, how to have fabrics that, that allow a woman not to be restricted, but also follow the shape of a body and the way that she paired different fabrics. So that's how we started. I thought a lot about obviously engineering and she was very interested in plaids and stripes. And, and those are things that um, I'm also interested in. And, um, but we wanted to do them in a different way. And whether we took um, stretchy sort of bustier type pieces and we put them in different places on the body or we um, engineered plaids to create mo a, a movement, just a visual movement. We wanted to really, as I mentioned, honor her. And, and it was that fine line of how does, when does it become too referential and not interesting? Because the last thing we wanted to do was to make a Claire McArdle dress. Um, but I think there's no one that would be more modern that today than Claire McArdle. I mean, as I said um, back then, well, I didn't say this, but her, her clothing, was would retail for ten dollars sometimes. So, and she had people doing couture in Europe that were actually looking at what she was doing and and referencing it. So it was so interesting to me because it was never about a very expensive price point, but it was always brilliant in solving many things that women were looking to solve. Yeah. So it sounds so much like your process was doing this really incredible archival research, looking for these kind of big ideas that were Claire McArdle, and then finding ways that you made them your own and where they kind of moved forward with, for you, Tori. I mean, that was very important because I, I, I really try never to reference anyone too closely. But what we did also is we had all of this incredible research and then we let it go. And then I, I even said to the team, like, don't even look again at any of her pieces, because the last thing we want to do is, is go, is, is, is go too close to anything. But, but, but her philosophies and the idea of taking fabrics that were humble and mixing it with something that was a more desirable and um, a little more flu was something I've always been interested in, that high, low and that contrast. And she was a contrarian. And back then to, to have um, Jersey and use it for an evening, a, a very dressy evening dress was something very different. So that's that to me is obviously as modern today as it was back then. And I remember, I remember seeing your show on Mercer Street, which is, you know, like maybe 15, 20 minute walk from where we are at Parsons. And even from the flats, 
right, that you had on oh, the models. We reissued, we worked with Capizio, who was amazing. And back, if you guys don't know them, I'm sure most people do, but they were known for their ballet flats. And I thought it was so fascinating. It was like the first collaboration, Claire McArdle and Capizio. So yeah, we, re we reissued, um, I think it was just one of her shoes that I absolutely love. That's so great. I mean, I think it's such an amazing way, not just to be inspired, but also to teach groups of people that hadn't heard of Claire McArdle about Claire McArdle and really elevate and celebrate a group of designers and a designer that was, I think, especially today had been unsung. And it's so much of, I know the course that we're going to launch next year is going to be about having our students take inspiration from that and think about how they can, through their design work, celebrate and center um, unsung women and female identified designers and underrepresented designers through their work. Very sadly, Ben, there are so many women that are um, not noted throughout history that have had such extraordinary impact. And that's something that we spend a lot of time thinking about, but also want to solve and really highlight those women and give them what is due to them. And that's recognition. And, and so that is, if anything comes of our partnership with, with um, the Maryland Center, it's, it's really about um, setting up, which we will be a program to teach people more about the influence she had um, back then, but obviously to, until today and the enormous impact she had on global fashion. I don't even want to say American fashion because it's it's really on fashion. Yeah, it makes me think so much of just the power that we have as designers and fashion professionals to use the collections and creative work we have to educate and to really teach people and really center incredible talent that hadn't gotten the recognition that they so rightly deserve. And this collection, I think, is just such a beautiful example of that. Um, and I know something our students will be very excited to do and work on next just year. Just to that point, as an art history major, I, um, Judith Leister was an old master, extraordinary painter, and she would have to sign her husband's name to her paintings. And um, not until maybe 30 years ago, which she recognized as one of the great old master painters, there's countless amounts of women that have been overlooked. And um, I'm super excited um, separately because we will be, I joined the board of the Smithsonian, which we, we will be highlighting these women uh, in the first women's museum, which um, will happen. Maybe, maybe it'll take seven years from now, but that's, that's something that um, people that have come through Parsons, there's so many extraordinary women and men, obviously that deserve, deserve that recognition. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's so, I think it's just an, also an exciting challenge for designers to think about how that work, their work can really be to celebrate people that haven't gotten the credit and recognition that they so rightly deserve. Um, and I know as our students sort of start to think about their own design work, as they think about this course for next year, we'd love to know your advice for our fashion design students. And what advice might you offer them as they look for topics that would inspire their work? I mean, I, I always say, well, first of all, go to, go to good old fashioned libraries and, and try not to do so much research online because I think that so many people online are seeing the exact same things. And I think it's so interesting to really delve into what really is uh, your inner inspiration and what is truly meaningful to you. And that goes back to your personal history and your experiences. And I always find that inspiration is the easy part. It comes can come from anywhere. It can come from an art exhibit, a movie, a book, but it's really about how do you really edit and really think through what the, how that inspiration turns into a collection. But certainly I am a big proponent of making it your own and having your own point of view. And I think as students start today, there's so much noise and so much stuff that you have to almost um, put blinders on and really think and, and listen to your internal voice of, of what is truly meaningful. Um, and, and how you see what you will present um, can make a significant impact and difference. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things I think that you, you touched on and that you do in your work is also drawing on your own lived experience, your own upbringing, um, right? That that is also knowledge and that's design knowledge that can inform your work. I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit about that, how your own lived experience and upbringing has informed your design work. 
Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, for a long time, I was running the business and 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 doing the creative. And luckily, my husband came on board about four, almost four years ago to to run the business. So it was almost a reinvention for me from a design perspective. And I finally had the time to think about and spend the time needed to really focus on design. Um, and I started with a Shaker collection and I grew up and I went to Quaker schools and it was right in the beginning of, of COVID. And it was, you couldn't go anywhere as we all know, and we were sitting at home and I really delved into my upbringing. And that was um, actually quite minimalist and Shaker, um, it, the, the shaker philosophy is really that. And so that was a bit of a refresher. And, and since that collection, I think the collections have been more me and personal to me rather than looking at the inspiration of my parents or their travels or, or things that um, were something that um, I started with. Um, now that I had the time to put in, um, I think that has, has really helped develop our collections in a more personal way. I think that's really inspiring advice for students to know that right, your lived experience is knowledge, is something you can draw on your upbringing and thinking about that, bringing that forward in your design. And Tori, as you've done that, you talked about the importance of that translation and that editing from doing the research, but then editing that into your design work and into a collection. And I'm wondering what advice would you offer students as they sort of embark on that research phase and as they think about translating that research? Yeah, I mean, so I say this to my team, sometimes we have too many ideas and, and, you know, that's when it gets to be um, confusing and not focused and over designed. And I think when you have a few good ideas, I would start there and then you really develop those ideas. And to me, that's when the most successful collections happen is when you're not um, just put, I mean, and some, some designers that I can think of are amazing and they have thousands of ideas in one collection. But for me, I like to really have fewer and, and then develop them and see them um, through rather than so many things going on. So it starts with a lot of ideas, but then quickly narrowing them yes. down and, and then building on those few and really extending those. And, and, you know, the idea of fabric and the way it drapes and, and obvious also thinking about sustainability, that's just so important. And I know it is for your students because that's the future. But I can tell you, it's a whole new world looking at that from um, moving your company in that direction. And certainly that's something that we are passionate about. We don't talk a lot about it because we have a long way to go, but we are working on many things. And I think if I were starting out now, that would be the guiding, the North Star of how I looked at everything. That's really helpful advice for students. Um, one of the things Marie Jean Vieff talked about in your introduction, and I wanted to pick up on, is the role of social responsibility and supporting women entrepreneurs. I mean, that's been so much the core of your work. And I'm wondering when, when in your career did you decide to center social responsibility as an entrepreneur and designer? So in 2004, when I went to raise money, that was my business plan. I said I wanted to start a company so that I could start a foundation for women. Um, I was pretty much laughed out of the room with most of the people that I went to meet. Most of the, most of the men that I went to um, try to raise money from said I should never say business. And uh, they sort of called it charity work or social responsibility in the same sentence. Um, it's so gratifying to see 17 years later that businesses are not innovative without purpose. And, you know, I always knew, and I don't know why I knew this, but it was just an instinct that doing good is good for business. And that is something that is a very important philosophy now. And uh, before businesses would start, they'd become successful. And then they'd set up a foundation, maybe 20, 30 years after their success. But if you can incorporate it into the, the DNA of your company, 
um, it can it can manifest in many different ways. We weren't able to start a foundation um, until th- 2009 because I didn't have the financials to do that. But it was always part of the conversation. And we would do things like uh, day it forward where we we give our employees a day off and they could focus on their personal charities. We would have um, kids that were from um, um, uh, just not great circumstances in at Christmas and we'd have Santa Claus and a Christmas tree and give them presents. We would just do things that were about good for our employees. They made us feel good. And it was actually just good for taking care of our community. And that was something that was before we started our foundation. And then when we started the foundation, it took me many years before I talked about it externally, because I really wanted real impact and scale. I was very worried about it being perceived as marketing in any way. And we all know there's a lot of greenwashing going on today. There's a, there's a lot of um, purple washing and it's, it's, you just have to be so careful. It has to be authentic, but it also has to, you, you have to have something to talk about before, before you start down that journey. And, and so it, took me, I would say, until from 2009 until about um, five years ago, before we felt that we had real data, real metrics, and we were making real progress around women's empowerment. And and also, um, we have different tangents of the foundation. It's it's definitely around that, but it's also, it's about um, unconscious bias and and race. And we we tackle serious issues, Um, the bias around ambition and women. Um, we work um, with with people in crisis, whether it's Afghanistan or Ukraine. Th- to have a platform and a business to create change is inspiring, and that's something I wish for all of you, all of you, as you go on your journey. What are I mean? You talked about that importance of impact, and obviously, there's so much impact you've had through the foundation and through your work with social responsibility. Um, What's one of those impacts that's sort of the most meaningful to you or that really stands out? I mean, I think it's when we see our entrepreneurs, we have a fellowship program where we pick 50 entrepreneurs a year and we mentor them throughout the year. And then they come to New York for a week and we introduce them to people in business. We do seminars. But but the, the thing that is most striking is that these women are brilliant, number one. They're often um, having two and three jobs so that they can hire other people. But when their companies reach a million dollars in revenue, we see a sustainable business. So we're really interested in helping people get a company to reach that milestone. So I think one of the things I'm most proud of is those women that have have reached that milestone and are scaling their business. And it's inspiring to see. They're they're pretty extraordinary. I keep talking about women. And the one thing I will say is that we also need men to be part of this conversation because we can be talking to each other for the rest of time and agree that we have issues, but things will never change unless men and women collectively create equality for women. Yeah, 100%. Um, and I think your work's also really done a phenomenal job of building bridges between people and bringing allies and advocates together. But you've been doing this since the beginnings. That was your goal since the very start of your business. What have been some of the challenges of advancing social responsibility in business and particularly in the fashion industry? Well, I think there were many people that just didn't believe in it. Um, and uh, it was not always easy, but um, one of the things my parents taught me that served me well is that negativity is noise. And I think that it's something I work at um, all the time still to this day. And I try to surround myself with people that are bringing positive energy. And, um, you know, I think everyone can have an opinion or not, but you have to believe in your mission and yourself. I think um, there's so many naysayers and we all know that. And so um, certainly, you you try to steer clear, but but also you you also try to bring people along. You don't want to always be around like minded people because then that's not progress either. You want to bring people along and 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 show them the impact. First of all, women 
are great investments. They're they're um, building economies. They're incredible entrepreneurs. And what one thing I also try, and I, and I'm sure you can relate to this, is create an environment w- which is a safe environment for people to be and feel. Um, free to be who they are, but also a flexible environment. And that's top of every conversation right now is how do you have a place where people can have the flexibility where they don't have to choose between children and a career. And I think that um, the pandemic has set us back in a big way. Um, Women had made more progress and now we have to make make up for that because of childcare. And 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 many of the women that um, had small businesses had to either close them or leave jobs. Um, So there's all, to answer your question more concretely, I think the negativity you stay away from, but at the same time, you try to bring people along. And you've proven it can be done. I mean, you've proven that a fashion business can grant social responsibility and have phenomenal impact. Um, I'm wondering when you think of your work with social responsibility with female entrepreneurs, does this have an impact on your creative process as a designer? How does it guide any of your creative work as a designer? Well, I mean, I think the one guiding principle is that I want to uh, um, give people collections where they can see themselves. And that to me um, is the best thing that I can hear that is um, about um, making people feel confident, but also it's all women and all kinds of women and men because men wear our collections too. But I think that um, if, if, if we can give collections where people see themselves and then and then have their own individuality and and the way they put it together, that's that's a big win for, for me. And people always ask me, do you wear do you only wear your collection? Of course not. I love fashion and I love mixing it up. And it would be so uninteresting to do that. I love vintage. I love other designers. And I think let's I love the way people take it and make it their own and mix it with with whatever they will. Yeah, I'm sure that's one of the most inspiring things when you see all of the ways where it's put things, your work together in new and interesting ways for them. Um, we talked about this, but I, you're still one of the few um, women leaders and chief design officers of a global fashion brand. Um, and in our program, the majority of our students are still women and female identified. And I wanted to ask you about your experiences navigating sexism within the fashion industry. I'm thinking of how female designers are continued to be represented in media, stereotypes in male dominated corporate culture. What have been some of your approaches, your strategies, your experiences navigating sexism in fashion? Yeah, I mean, I remember about five years ago, I I was introduced as a female CEO and I got up and I started laughing and I I said, you know, I've never in my life heard of a man introduced as a male CEO. Um, That is just such the tip of the iceberg. I think that, um, you know, you people have to be supportive and it's not just men that aren't supportive of women it's women as well and i think that um i've had so many different experiences and and the the truth is my parents raised me to believe that i could do anything my three brothers could do so when i got into the workforce it was a bit shocking to see that there was a a a certain treatment based on gender. And it was something that I was um, quite frankly appalled by and certainly have been um, at the end of of that, of of being treated in a sexist way. And and I think that you have to um, really be strong and hold people accountable and and have a voice and i think that that's something that i recommend to to students today um but also to my to my kids i think it's encouraging to see that i have three boys that are in college and they um don't think of women or men differently and that's um something that i'm proud of but i think i hope the sentiment is changing and i think over the last 10 years, people are being held accountable. And there are standards that people are going to have to adhere to. And and I think if they don't, it's up to all of us to point it out. 
And I think we all have to own that and be accountable. It can't just be a few people at the top. It has to be people at every level that if they're feeling marginalized, they have to come forth and say that. Yeah, there's certainly work that everyone in fashion has to foster gender equity. Um, yeah, when we think of women, uh, binary people, trans people, so many people who face- Everyone. Yeah, it, everything you said, I think is so important and like really fostering the culture where we develop allyship to move things forward. Um, we talked a little and bit I about- guess, like, You know yeah. what, Ben, I guess one thing, my grandmother used to say, you never learn anything with your mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> and I think being a good listener is really important and, and being curious and, and hearing the way people feel uh, about their experience around you. I think you can be an advocate for someone and, and step in as well and, and really be a great support system. I love that expression. You never hear <laughs> yeah. things with your mouth open. I think it's so true, right? That feedback from folks is like something so generous that they care enough about <laughs> you to share that experience with you and how much you can learn from that. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, and then, you know, I think companies have their own part in this as well. And they have to constantly, I mean, we have culture surveys, we do check ins, it's um, the whole concept of equal pay is something that we're fanatical about, but we had work to do and we had to, we have to work at it. It's like the culture of your company, you have to constantly work at it. It's not something that is just a given. Yeah. And as a result, when you do and staff members see that work, it makes a big difference and they know. Well, and it allows people to be their most creative. And I think when people are happy and in a safe and healthy environment, they thrive and they're their most creative. Yeah, yeah ultimately. So, so to your students, you have to be in a place that you feel safe and feel you are appreciated and people are are making you shine. I think that's something we talk a lot about is is letting people shine under underneath us that work for us. Yeah. Yeah. And I think whether it's in your place of work, whether it's in your classroom here at Parsons, right? I think something we all want to do is make sure everyone can be their most authentic self. Because as you said, Tori, when you are and you feel you're in that safe space, you can be your most creative self too. Exactly. We talked a little bit about sort of some of your lived experiences and your experiences growing up, how that's inspired your collections. How has that been a benefit to you as an entrepreneur? How have you drawn on your own lived experience as a fashion entrepreneur? I mean, I, I, I lived in a, a bit of a crazy childhood that I lived in the middle of nowhere on a farm. Um, with many kind of experiences that, that people might not imagine. So I think the concept of diversity and the concept of acceptance and anything goes um, and you roll with the punches is, is how I was raised. I grew, grew up with um, uh, my parents that were very fashionable, <laughs> but that said, I was, I was not interested in fashion at all. I was, I was a complete tomboy, as I mentioned. I was interested in tennis and riding horses and um, doing whatever my brothers did. So um, I think, you know, everyone has their story and there's so many interesting stories and you find things that will surprise you that become your story and your inspiration. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, at first when I started the company, it was about my parents. But then when I had time to really think about it over the last five years, it became something very different. And I'm not sure if you've seen the, the change, but it, it's different. It's, it's, it's definitely different than, than where we were. And I'm so proud of, of what we built, but it's finding those personal things that really stand out. And, and I think every single person has them. And it, it's interesting the way you think about them and the way they can translate into your creative process. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, that's such a, for our conversation, that's such an inspiring note, I think to end on because it makes it, this is something we all have. Um, there's all deep lived experiences that we, different things will stand out to us at different points in our lives, but that we can draw upon. Um, Luke, I want to pass it over now to Luke, who is our BFA program administrator 
to moderate questions if all of you are students. So it looks like uh, Emily is wondering, Tori, what is a typical day for you? Oh my God. Well, I think it, no day is really typical, but I think um, that's what is so interesting. I, this morning, I can tell you this morning, um, I worked on our sport collection uh, and it's interesting because we started a, a separate sport collection about six years ago, maybe seven years ago at this point. And um, you, you live and learn. And it was um, something that I thought it'd be really interesting to have a separate and a separate logo and, and separate branding. And we realized pretty quickly that it, it was not the right idea. So one thing that I've been really good at is when you make mistakes, you pivot quickly. So um, we, we changed um, the logo and now we're thinking about sport, which I love this collection, but in terms of how do you integrate it um, um, in a way where you have tennis and golf and keep it separate um, because you want it to be super technical, but then you have sports inspired, um, ready to wear that's more elevated and the idea of luxury sport. So we, we had that, then we worked on store design. Then I had a meeting about our uh, summit, which is our foundation summit on um, ambition and stereotypes. And I would love some of all of you guys and your students to come. It's June 14th at Lincoln Center. Um, so that's going to be re a really interesting day. Um, and then it could be um, marketing and then um, working on some dresses for um, some people coming to the Met with us, um, which is on American fashion, the second the second um, tranche. And I think it's going to be uh, apparently it's going to be amazing, uh, the exhibition. So that's something you all have to see. Can you tell us a little bit more about the summit, Tori? Yeah, so um, this will be our um, third. We do it every two years. And in fact, the last time we did it was probably the day before lockdown of COVID. Had it been one day later, we would have canceled it. But we we curate the audience. It's 1,200 people and it's for free. But what we ask is that you write an essay about why you want to come and um, your experience around bias, um, unconscious bias, race, um, ambition, any of the things that have either propelled you or held you back. And so we literally read through thousands of essays and then we curate the audience um, to 1,200 people. And we have maybe 50 speakers. We have a couple performers. And um, it can be everyone, uh, women and men. Um, and we talk about difficult subjects, but also wonderful subjects. And um, it could be Billie Jean King. It could be um, to a firefighter who was helping uh, who, a trans firefighter. So um, it really covers the gamut. And um, I think it's a really wonderful, um, inspiring day with incredibly inspiring people. Sounds incredible. Luke, I see we have so many other questions in the chat while we were talking. I'll let you take over. Mm -hmm. It's all good. Um, let's see. This one was really interesting. Are you currently working in any 3D software? Um, and how have you integrated that into your brand and process? So we we are um, actually working on sneakers and it's incredibly helpful um, designing um, sneakers with that technology. It's still early days for us. Um, you know, all the NFTs and the metaverse and th those are things that um, we want uh, maybe at some point, but as far as 3D and design and like even 3D printing, it's amazing how that, takes weeks where you can wait for a mold um, and it happens in a matter of hours. So it is pretty incredible the impact that has um, to the supply chain and design process. Thanks. Um, very interesting. Um, we will be doing more on our site as well, even just um, shooting the look and feel of the product. Love that. Um, and then I believe it's Celine. She was wondering um, before when you are focused both on running of the business and designing, how did you manage between the two while also being an entrepreneur and designer? And is there one side that you lean more towards? 
So I, I would say, I don't know how smart it was that I did that for 14 years. And I wish I, I will, first of all, I had to marry my husband to get him to be CEO of our company. Um, having someone with his uh, skills, his expert skills that I really struggled with day in and day out. Um, but I loved it. But it was, um, I, I think in retrospect, it probably would have been better if I just stuck to my passion, which is design. Um, that said, we built an extraordinary company with an incredible team. But um, it was harder for me to um, really do the things that come so naturally to Pierre Eve and, and with, with such ease. So I sit and, and think about all the, the time I could have saved uh, a, a, lot of, a, a lot of tough um, situations had, had I had him earlier. But um, it, it, it worked out. And, and you know, I think now I can tell you I'm much more passionate about the creative process and design. And, and the foundation, because that's that's a big part of what I do. That's great. Um, how has COVID changed the way you design? In that you know, COVID, to, it sort of all happened at the same time, but I think it gave me time to really hone in on, on the design process, to really rethink how we think about um, the product from start to finish and the cycle. And one thing people don't talk a lot about when talking about the environment and sustainability is inventory and how do you design less and have less, but everything with more integrity. So that's something um, that COVID has allowed me and our team to do is really have, um, as I mentioned earlier, more focused precise collections and and really focus on on the actual buys and how 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 the product goes from how it is made to to where it ends up and the cycle of it hmm. very nice um, let's see i sorry i lost it it scrolled up on me um uh, Tao is wondering for people who don't have a design background but want to move forward, um, what suggestions would you give? I would say if I can do it, anyone can do it. <laughs> I, I was an art history major at Penn, and I had um, I you know I worked in our industry, and I think I paid my dues in some respects. My last job was working for LVMH, and mm -hmm. I was working for Loewe. And I realized um, that I had um, to give up my career because I had three babies under the age of four. I had three boys under the age of four. Um, that said, when I started our company, I had never designed and I had never run a business. So um, really, I, if I can do it, I will say you can do it too. And it's a lot of hard work and exhausting, but so much fun as well. Just be, as my parents told me, be buckle up and thicken your skin. <laughs> I love that. That's a, that's actually a really good kind of just like reminder in daily life as well. Um, Jane is wondering what concept trend or initiative are you most excited to see develop in the fashion industry future? Well, I think just um, people really um, talking about um, governance, sustainability, and social um, implementation into your business. Like to me, having all of that be a must is the best thing that could happen to business overall and to our, our world, to have businesses really be accountable and, and, and really make serious strides to be better for the environment, which will take time. I don't want to say that we're there by any stretch, but we're making steps to have, to have places for people to go where they feel safe, as I mentioned, and great places to work. And, and, and really have that infused into the business is, is I hope not a trend. I hope it's, it's here to stay in a reality. Um, that said, I think product that is made from um, recycled and sustainable materials is very exciting. It's, we, we just worked on a tote that was made out of old basketballs and it 
looks like crocodile. We, it's the most incredible material. And they took old basketballs and um, chopped them up and melted it and then created this crocodile pattern. And it's pretty, pretty amazing. That's great. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, how did you believe that you were going to succeed when you started your brand? And like, what plans did you make and early steps did you take to achieve those goals? I mean, it was a bit of a dichotomy because on one hand, I talked a big game. I, I'm a little embarrassed when I think about some of the things I said that I wanted to build this global lifestyle brand so I could start a foundation. That said, I, I, there's always a bit of self-doubt. So I'm not, I'm not sure I ever thought or still to this day think I'm um, you know, patting myself on the back because that's just not who I am. And I can tell you the minute I do that, things don't go my way. So I, I think it's a journey and it's one day at a time and you just do the best you can. And um, that's, that's how I look at it. I, I never think like, oh, we've made it and this is a success. I think what could we be doing better and let's be proud and, and um, celebrate the things we've done. Oh, Tori, that you've shared so much insight with us, and I think remaining humble, continuing to prioritize social responsibility in our work, and really coming up with a few ideas and building on those, editing, and so much more. So thank you for spending this hour, for sharing your insight, and we're so excited for this partnership, for this course next year, and everything we'll do together. Thank so thanks. you so much, and good luck to everyone. I know your, your finals are coming up, so good luck. Thank you so much, everyone. Right. Take Bye. care. Bye.